Hello everyone. Today we'll be learning about the debate between whether cathode rays were made of particles or waves and the experiment that finally solved this dispute. Now cathode rays were very confusing to 19th century scientists. In some ways, cathode rays behaved like particles. They were deflected by magnetic fields, so they must have electric charge. They must be made of particles. Uh, they caused paddle wheels to turn, so they must have momentum. Uh, they travelled slower than light, which meant that they must be made of matter. And they left the cathode at 90 degrees instead of radiating in all directions. All these seem to point toward the fact that cathode rays were made of streams of particles. On the other hand, in some ways, the cathode rays behaved like waves. They travelled through thin metal foils without damaging or interacting with them. Uh, and they were almost massless, at least compared to atoms, the only other form of matter known. And so this caused great confusion among the scientific community. A lot of the properties of cathode rays could be explained by both parties, but some could only be explained by one. So looking at some of the properties of cathode rays, we have that objects struck by cathode rays heat up. The wave theorists said that, well, we know of other electromagnetic waves that can heat things up, so perhaps the cathode rays are electromagnetic. Um, the particle theorists so the kinetic energy of the particles was simply being converted to heat, and that's what was causing the objects to heat up. All right, so let's look at another property. The rays caused paddle wheels to turn. The wave theorists said that this was because the cathode rays were heating up the metal wheel, and that was causing it to turn. The particle theorists said that it was simple conservation of momentum, which of course you learn about in year 11. Uh, the rays were deflected by magnetic fields. The wave theorists had no explanation for this. The particle theorist said, well, that's easy, the particles are electrically charged, and electrically charged particles are bent by magnetic fields. And another property is that the rays pass through foil without interacting. The wave theorist said, well, this is just like x-rays, they can pass through metals without interacting with them. And the particle theorist had no explanation whatsoever, because as far as they knew, particles didn't work that way. Now, the main hurdle in the way of the particle theory was that the rays were not deflected by electric fields. And this seemed to prove that they weren't electrically charged, which meant that they could only be waves, which of course didn't match with the magnetic field experiments. J.J. Thompson discovered that the reason that the rays were not deflected was due to the ionization of gas inside the tube. And the ionized gas prevented the electric field from having any effect on the cathode rays, and so prevented it from being deflected. We have an animation of that here. The cathode ray inside the cathode ray tube uh, ionizes the gas inside the tube, causing it to split into positive and negative parts. When the electric field is applied, the ionized gas is attracted to the plates, preventing it from creating a, an electric field that can affect the path of the cathode ray. Now, when J.J. Thompson was finally able to remove enough of the gas from the vacuum chamber to discover the effects of the electric field, the situation stopped being like this, where there was no electric field due to the ionization of the gas, and became something like this, where the cathode ray was in fact bent due to the electric field. Now, the results show that the cathode rays were attracted to the positive plate, and, as we know from our study of electric fields, this means that the cathode rays are negatively charged, which worked well and sort of tied in with the experiments on magnetic fields, which showed the same thing. So now we have a short timeline of the experiments, and the, the experiments on cathode rays and the discovery of their nature. In 1858, Julius Plucker managed to deflect cathode rays with magnets. In 1869, J.W. Hittoff managed to block the rays, which cast a shadow. In 1875, William Crookes conducted many experiments on the rays, some of which we'll be covering in the next topic. And in 1883, Heinrich Hertz failed to deflect rays with the electric fields, seeming to prove that they weren't electrically charged. In 1890, Arthur Schuster determined that the rays were not atomic, so that seemed to lend evidence to the idea that they were made of waves. In 1894, J.J. Thompson showed that the wet rays were traveling too slowly to be made of electromagnetic waves. In 1895, Jean-Baptiste Perrin showed that the cathode rays deposited negative electric charge on objects in the field, in objects in the cathode ray tube, rather. And finally, in 1897, J.J. Thompson showed that the cathode rays were in fact deflected by electric fields, 
and this was the discovery of the electron. This ends the theory. We have learned uh, that cathode rays are in fact particles, and we have learned of the debate between whether they are waves or not. Now on to some questions. Question 5. Cathode rays striking an object cause it to heat up. Does this support the wave theorists or the particle theorists? Well, let's consider the options. D says the evidence does not support any of these hypotheses, but we know that uh, all the observations of the cathode rays could be explained by at least one of the two parties. So, uh, does it support only cathode rays and made of particles? We know that electromagnetic waves can heat up objects, so it can't just be that they're made of uh, particles. Uh, could it be that they're just waves then? Well, we also know that small uh, particles can heat up targets, so it can't just be B either. So the answer must be C. It supports both the particle theory and the wave theory. And indeed, we see that C is the answer. Question 6. Cathode rays in the presence of a magnetic field change direction. Which theory does this support? We know, that, of course, that it's not D, because all, all properties of cathode rays could be explained by one of the two parties. Could it be that the cathode rays are waves then? Well, electromagnetic waves cannot be charged, and so they shouldn't be deflected by magnetic fields. So the answer can't be B, and nor can it be C, because that means that it would have to support both waves and particles. And so we find that the answer must be A. Cathode rays are made of particles because only particles can have electric charge. And indeed, A is the answer. Question 7. Draw the electric field created by two parallel plates in a cathode ray tube in perfect vacuum. Be sure to include its effect on the cathode ray. Now the answer to this is a large cathode ray, which we can see here. As we can see, it's connected to a voltage with cathode rays coming out of the cathode. The electric field in a vacuum goes straight across the tube without being interfered, by, interfered with by any ionized gas. And this, of course, causes the cathode ray to bend in the opposite direction of the electric field. Question 8. Draw the electric field created by two parallel plates inside a cathode ray tube filled with ionized gas. Be sure to include its effect on the cathode ray. So this is a question very similar to the last one. So again, we'll have a cathode ray. But here, the electric field won't be so pronounced. The ionized gas inside the tube is causing the electric field to stop short before it can interact with the cathode rays. And subsequently, the cathode rays move straight across the tube without being deflected at all. This concludes this section. We've learned about the debate about whether cathode rays were made of waves or particles and the experiment that finally solved it.